Thank you all for coming. Good evening. Uh, it's really we're delighted to welcome you back to the next uh, uh, series of lectures in our conversation series, number 14 now, and we have a very nice program uh, all through the spring. I'm Dietrich Norman, I'm the director of the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and Cultural Heritage, and maybe I could just quickly switch to the new poster. You see it here, uh, all the way through April uh, 21, and we have a uh, very interesting mix, I think, of people who are here at Brown. You see the director of the new uh, Brown Arts Institute, and uh, we have a uh, man running for mayor, and we have great uh, activists, and we have our guest professor, Philip Moiser, who is here this semester from Germany, and who is with us today, over there in the back, with his wife Natasha. So welcome. He's going to speak here. Uh, and of course, we have uh, Bert Krenka and uh, Barnaby Evans and many others. It's going to be a, a great season, I think, and so I'm glad that you're back. And uh, I have to make an announcement, though. Obviously, COVID is still with us, as you know, and Brown asked us to um, not serve food for the first weeks of the two weeks of the semester to encourage everyone to keep their mask on when they uh, talk. Of course, I couldn't help them. We'll still have some uh, wine afterwards and water. Uh, so, but uh, we are asked by Brown to ask you to keep your mask on when you converse so that we don't spread the virus. And um, oh, I wanted to mention, here's uh, Zibi and, and Zizu, our, uh, Zizu, our two helpers tonight. Thank you very much for checking everybody in. That was really great because our two students are uh, not around tonight, and that's helping me out a lot. <coughs> so it's really a great pleasure to introduce Rob Emlin, our speaker tonight. Uh, some of you might recall that when we started this whole thing last semester, the first speaker was Martha Barenfels, who was one of the architects of the renovation of this house. And so it is kind of fitting that we have with us today Rob Emlin, who was the founding director of the John Nicholas Brown Center, uh, and uh, was here as director from 1988 to 1993. He oversaw the renovation and restoration of this National Historic Landmark. And he has great stories to tell. And I'm sure the topic tonight is something else, but if you have questions uh, for Rob, I've heard several stories of an amazing operation of getting big steel beams into this wooden house through, I think, what is now my office, through the window and through the wall. And there's uh, wonderful adventures to talk about. He came to Brown in 1985 and was our university curator and senior lecturer in the American Studies Department from 1985 to, 19, uh, to 2017. Uh, at the same time, he also taught at the Rhode Island School of Design, uh, courses in, in both places in material culture studies and topics in American decorative arts. At the RISD Museum, Rob has also served as associate curator of decorative arts, and together we served on the public art committee for I think several decades, if I'm not mistaken, and it was great fun to uh, uh, be involved in getting art on campus. Rob has a very long list of publications, several about this house and its restoration, others about the Brown family, a really key um, essay about the Zuber wallpaper uh, that you all know from the hallway. Um, and uh, one of his key interests, obviously, is local history. He and his wife, Julia, live in an old farmhouse in Seekonk. And, uh, uh, another focus is the world of the Shakers, and Rob has just fairly recently published his third book on the Shakers called Imagining the Shakers, how the visual culture of Shaker life was pictured in the popular illustrated press of 19th century America. But tonight, Rob is going to talk about the history of our campus, and so please help me welcome Rob Evans. Thank you, Dietrich. Those of you who drove in this evening, from this direction, past uh, Brook Street, saw some uh, demolition going on, and Brown is always growing, always changing, always evolving, and so uh, that's the next step. I don't know anything about what's going on over there, so um, I thought that I might speak this evening about uh, a big project that took place here 50 years ago, and no. 75 years ago, and uh, the creation of a, of a fraternity quadrangle that uh, changed things um, for the university, uh, changed the size and scope and uh, prominence of the university, and a big push to um, become a, um, 
a, a fuller and bigger and more sophisticated place. So if you uh, would like to talk about Brown's current plans for the um, renovating the campus and expanding the campus, I understand. It's just that I don't know anything about it and I'm not able to contribute to that conversation at this point. I thought that it'd be just easier to talk about uh, what Brown looked like um, in former times. This is the campus that we know today. And, you know, those of us who are students have seen it over the course of four years and gotten to know it, and our grad students have seen it over the course of uh, seven years, and people who have taught here, like Dietrich and me, have seen it over the course of 30 years. And so we know about this in our lifetimes, but Brown's been doing business out of the same address for 250 two years here, so it, um, it has been many different things over the years. It started small. Uh, it started with this one academy building. Um, the cellar hall was uh, being excavated for that uh, 252 years ago this spring with a little house next to it for the president, and it took 50 years for it to expand to uh, two buildings. And so it was a slow growing place. And all the land that it owned just was um, from uh, Waterman Street on the left, uh, Angel Street on the left to Waterman Street on the right. Uh, so not quite, where are I? One block down, I'm sorry, from Waterman Street on the left to uh, George Street on the right. And that was the entire Brown campus. So um, by 1908, when, it, uh, when this lithograph was published, there were only 20 buildings on campus. And it's not that long ago. I mean, it was before our lifetimes. But um, in 1908, this was the campus. It's kind of a fun picture because the 20 buildings that Brown owns are pictured in, in uh, reddish colors. Or if they're stone, they're pictured in white. And then the rest is just the forest primeval. You know, there's nothing out there besides Brown. As we know, College Hill was entirely built out by 1908. There's nothing, uh, no vacant lots here or no tall timber waiting to be felled. But one of the interesting things is that um, the places that Brown did not own, here and here, these houses along the side are sort of shown in these ghostly colors. And that is an indication that um, uh, while Brown was first on this hill, and, and the local papers were making terrible fun of the university, saying no one ever goes up on top of that hill. It's just a sheep pasture. You really have no business going up there. It's too muddy to get up there. And nobody, you know, they should have built downtown like normal people. Uh, little by little, the neighbors started coming up and building their houses around the campus. It was an attractive place to be. So there are those houses in these little ghostly colors. Um, uh, indicating that it wasn't really the forest primeval with Brown in the center of it. Down in the lower right here, um, in the lower right corner, is uh, this house from uh, 1854. Uh, and it's a double house uh, with a wall through up to the middle. When the families lived there, gave it up finally. Brown acquired it. It's now administrative offices. And then over in this corner is another one of those little vestigial drawings here that you can't quite make out. And there's another house that uh, came up to join the, uh, the college on College Hill. So um, there, as little by little, as people moved out of these houses, the families moved out, Brown acquired them and moved in and spread out a little bit. Um, over here between Fonts House, which is here, and Hope College, which is here, there's a little view corridor that goes out. And you can see um, that that's just more houses there. Brown owns the one on the left and does not own the one on the right. And it's just, just one of the most wonderful things about the campus is that it, it's not a fortified campus like 
Yale or places that have gates and walls. You can just wander in and out and you're suddenly in a neighborhood full of, uh, of nice places with people living in them. It's one of the most wonderful things about coming to Brown is to that discovery of the, the permeable nature of the neighborhood. So there's, um, there's old houses that have come to Brown and uh, which now Brown uh, sooner or later will take on as the old families have gone. Now, uh, this is a, um, a plate from a, an insurance map of 1837. These were pub published for insurance companies who were trying to um, figure out what every structure in the neighborhood was, what it was made of, how big it was, how close it was to its neighbors. And these were published sequentially over the years. Um, the uh, red buildings are brick and the brown ones are masonry and the ones that are not colored are wood. And in the center of this uh, Hopkins map from 1837, we see Brown University. And that's it, that's the quad at Brown. And all around here is just the neighborhood. And that's not Brown in 18, I'm sorry, 1937. I'll zoom in a bit and so we can see this. Brown, as it understood itself, was just, just here. Well, of, you know, of course, the John Hay Library is here and Van Wickle Hall is across the way, but mostly when you thought about Brown, you thought about this, and you didn't really think about this. Here is um, Brown Street. Here's the John Carter Brown Library and Brown Street. <coughs> Here's a neighborhood of houses and other uh, structures, barn, uh, car barns and so forth out there. But it's, um, uh, it's, it's not really Brown University, if you would judge from looking at this map. Here's a slightly later map from eight, uh, 1943, which pictures the buildings at Brown, that same aspect we're looking at with the quad. But surrounding it, you will see um, little outlines of buildings. Uh, there are many more buildings, as we just saw, uh, on College Hill, but these are um, just in outline. And when you get in close, they say things like Beta Theta Phi and Lama uh, something Alpha and Delta Kappa Epsilon. And that's one reason Brown is so small in these years is because a lot of people, a lot of uh, the guys are living off campus in fraternity houses. And there's 17 of them in this picture. Um, not at Brown, but across the street from Brown. And indeed, this house right here is a fraternity house. And that means it's full of 19-year-olds who are 40 feet away from campus and over whom Brown has absolutely no control. So, um, you know, vexing the neighbors vexing the university and uh, for a million reasons, uh, unsatisfactory to everybody except for the students who were there. <laughs> so uh, I just had pointed out that, um, uh, that view corridor between Fonts House and Hope College looking over to Pi Lambda Phi, but um, if you would also uh, look over here on Waterman Street at Delta Upsilon. That house still stands. Uh, one building down from the mail room. And if you would go down uh, below the John Hay Library here, Pi Delta Theta, Alpha Delta Phi, Zeta Phi. Um, those buildings are now all um, university buildings. Well, some of them were, were removed at the List Art Building. You see the tall one is, uh, is on the site of a couple of those uh, fraternities that were removed. But in the 1930s, when these pictures and 40s, when these pictures were made, that's where the um, majority of students lived, was off campus. Enter Henry Riston, um, uh, President Riston, here in his portrait behind him, you see 
Manning Hall on the left and, uh, and uh, University Hall on the right. He was a great lover of great old classical serious architecture. Um, he was teaching at Lawrence College, now Lawrence University, and felt quite strongly about fraternities. He liked them very much, and he thought that they were a great vehicle for, um, for educating young men about their responsibilities in the world as citizens. Uh, and he uh, wrote a book called um, Educational Housing, and the idea would you, you get everybody into a fraternity and make them come to talks after supper and have serious discussions. And, and he's, Brown at this point was uh, full of young men who you know, would study physics and chemistry and then go off to work in the family's mill. And he said, how about we raise these people to be citizens of the world? We've got rising fascism in Europe. We've got communist menace coming in. And don't you think that we need to um, uh, educate these people to be masters of the universe? We need to have a, a generation or, a, or a, a race of young men who will, um, who will confront the world's problems head on. And so uh, Brown in those years had had not very dynamic leaders. There was a Clarence Barber was not well. His successor was uh, President Barber's successor, S were, uh, were uh, pro tem, they were acting as presidents. And so in 1937, um, uh, the corporation uh, thought this would be a great idea to kick an up a notch and to um, become a, uh, a, a competitor or a, a uh, comparable university to uh, to its colleague schools in the Ivy League, to Harvard and Yale and, and Penn and Dartmouth. So he was hired to come and, um, uh, to come in and uh, enhance the university's reputation and usefulness. And so um, when, he, he, when he came, one of his very first jobs was the renovation of University Hall, the, uh, that colonial building, the great big academy building. And uh, he put the arm on John D. Rockefeller, class of 1898, uh, whose um, uh, patronage in largesse had helped Colonial Williamsburg revive. And uh, he brought Colonial Williamsburg's architects here to Providence to turn University Hall into a, uh, a stable, workable uh, building with colonial elegance in it. And, um, and then they, proposed that they would have a, a residential quad here on the corner of George Street and Brown Street across the street from, um, from the, the quad that we know, the, uh, the, the main green, the John Carter Brown Library being right here and step across the street and we were going to have what it says is the men's quadrangle. The Pembroke students were doing just fine in Henry Wriston's imagination up where they were on the Pembroke campus. But this was a, a <coughs> way to gather all the uh, fraternity lads together in, under Henry Wriston's uh, watchful eye. And so he went to these guys uh, in these various shadow buildings around the outside and said, if you will give title to um, Brown University of your buildings, uh, the first thing that will happen is you'll you will be able to pay no more real estate, real estate tax. You'll be able to, um, you'll be tax exempt, or Brown will be tax exempt, and so <coughs> your taxes will be waived. And all the students said, boy, what a deal. We can't believe our good luck. And, but what he meant was, little by little, we'll be drawing you into the fold under my uh, supervision, and I will be... Um, uh, bringing you into a, a system of, um, of fraternity uh, oversight that will um, uh, start to regularize things for the campus and for the community. Now, um, this aerial photograph, it says an airplane view looking westward from 1948. Uh, the uh, the quad is here. 
Here's the John Carter Brown Library. There is the flagpole. There is University Hall. And what he had proposed to do, uh, and it wasn't all his idea, the corporation of the university, was proposing to uh, demolish the buildings on these blocks. We have a different idea now about uh, old buildings that in the neighborhood at Brown. We think of them as a national treasure. But in those years, uh, it was just a good post-World War II booster time. Uh, the corporation was ready to take the big leap forward and, uh, and start to compete with Yale for, uh, for excellent students. And as a matter of fact, when he arrived here and got his feet under him, um, uh, Riston said uh, to the admissions office, uh, if you, uh, when we look at uh, admission requests uh, to uh, Brown, if uh, these applications uh, don't accept anyone who is, uh, who, for whom we're not the first choice. If, it, if we're not first on the list, uh, they don't get in. And that was quite a shock for a lot of people. But it worked, and very soon, uh, we started attracting um, stronger students and more students. And so um, part of that push to go ahead was uh, included demolishing the houses on those, those, that block, those two blocks. So here's another reminder. Here's Brown University. Um, Thayer Street, the Soldiers Memorial Arch, uh, University Hall, and then over here something that is not actually Brown University, but is about to be. Uh, here's Thayer Street going down, and it's cut out the Anne Marie Brown Memorial and uh, Andrews House, which was then the faculty club, and most recently was the health uh, services. We know what was there because uh, Brown uh, took it upon itself to make photographs of what was there. So when we look down Thayer Street, um, there's uh, Savoy Liquor and Hanley's Ale and Lager Beer and a couple of luncheonettes. And um, then there's going to be around the corner a dry cleaner and, and a gas station. This is not a triumph of American architecture. This is just buildings that people thought might be disposable. If we turn the corner and look up Benevolent Street, um, there's the gas station, there's the uh, Coca-Cola sign, which you can just see here in the uh, corner on the right. And then these houses going up were not great houses um, architecturally. They, uh, they were all owned by Brown. Brown had spent the previous decades acquiring them and filling them full of uh, faculty and staff. And so the, um, uh, I don't think anybody ever thought that these, there was any problem saving these, uh, or, or any problem with uh, any, any reason to save these. One exception to this, of course, is that big uh, cube we see on Thayer Street. Now, we've just been looking here at George, here is St. Stephen's Church, and here's Thayer, and here's Benevolent, and here's Charlesfield, and right there is not a little dry cleaner. That is the, um, that is the, um, the elementary school for the neighborhood, the Thayer Street School. And so, Brown sat down with the city of Providence and said, how about that school? It's built in 1868. It's had 75 years of 80 years of 10-year-olds kicking it. And um, why don't we just knock it down? And the city of Providence said, great. You know, we'll trade you. We'll, if you will give us some land over on Brook Street to build a firehouse, um, then knock it down. So there was not a lot of um, champions here for saving the, uh, the old buildings in this neighborhood. It had a nice plaque on it. We've saved the plaque. There it is. 
erected in 67, dedicated in 68 by Alfred Stone, architect. That plaque is still where it was, it's just the building is gone, but it's still on the site of the new building that replaced it. So here we start, coming down Thayer Street, this is the refectory, and uh, turning up um, Benevolent Street, and by the time we extend over here, we're going to throw up Benevolent Street, abandon it, and so you can no longer, uh, there'll be a building straight through here, and you cannot uh, pass through Benevolent Street at that point. From the Brown Alumna Newsletter, a new quadrangle, the university has broken ground in the largest building program in its history. Nine buildings are being torn down or removed to make room for the new $1 million dining room. Ultimately, about 50 buildings will be removed in the area bounded by Brown, Charles Field, Thayer, and George Streets, the location for the dormitory quadrangle. <coughs> so, here we are with a pretty nice looking, actually, wooden house from maybe the 1860s on the corner of George and uh, George going up and Thayer going down here. Okay, here's the Thayer Street uh, Elementary School. And that will go away. There's nobody who wants to save it. And in its place, we see this today the refectory. Um, it was typical of uh, Perry Shaw Hepburn, the architects, and um, Henry Wriston, not to call this a dining room, as it was just called in the, um, in the uh, Pembroke newsletter, but it, uh, it was called a refectory. It's much more elegant, and uh, the students in no time at all called it the rat factory, and uh, and after that, got quick and quickly changed to the ratty. So if you go now and ask the students where the uh, refectory is, uh, let's see. Well, and you say, well, you know, where everybody eats. They say, oh, you mean the ratty. You know, the, so it's a back formation from refectory to rat factory to ratty. Just uh, as you're wandering around the campus, you will need to know this. <coughs> and then farther up George Street on the left, um, a building like this. Uh, building this is this little village of uh, of independent buildings. It seems it's um, they did an okay job of trying to mimic College Hill by not by having one huge block of housing, but to break it up into little houses for each fraternity. And that replaced this. Now, it had just been a few years since Antoinette Downing had published the groundbreaking book, um, The Early Homes of Rhode Island. And so people understood what early houses looked like in Rhode Island and how great they were. So uh, a house like this, people thought, well, maybe it's small enough to move. A house like this, we could uh, find a space for it and drag it off somewhere and save it. There wasn't a lot of open space on College Hill, but people began to think, gosh, it'd be a shame to lose some of these they called them colonial houses, but what they meant was late 18th century and early 19th century houses. But that super duper carriage house on the left, nobody cared about. You know, I mean, we would love to have a condo on that house right now, <laughs> but um, I, I think it was invisible to them. Here we are farther up uh, George Street. And as we get up higher on the hill, this is an old story, uh, the houses on the top of the hill tend to be uh, bigger and, and uh, more expensive than the ones down at the bottom of the hill. Um, these were all just given up to make that fraternity quad. Here, on, we're, we've just jumped off a block. We're now on Benevolent Street, and this street will soon be cut off and built over. But with a house like this, on the top of the hill, it's a grand house. It was lived in by Professor Beatty and owned by Brown and rented out, as were everything else here. Uh, in the far right, you can see the stone building by Norman Isham, the um, uh, Anne Marie Brown Memorial that still stands. But uh, this was the house adjacent to it, all gone now. All gone for a better cause. 
Uh, this is across the street from Professor Beatty's house. It's applied math is in this house. <coughs> I mean, it was obviously built as a residence once upon a time, and now in 1948 is, is the math department. And too big to move, um, but a substantial building, a good, solid, well-built, attractive building, just invisible to the people who were um, thinking about uh, historic preservation. Around the corner on Charles Field, we didn't need uh, to uh, take this house but, um, or this one, but these two were, uh, or this, I'm sorry, this last one uh, was in the way, but it was small enough that it could be moved. And as a matter of fact, there was some land for it. Here is, here is Charles Field, so here are the houses I'm just talking about, and here's a athletic complex across the way. And so the ones that were small enough, there was a number of people in town who were saying what a shame it would be to lose everything. And the ones that can be moved, let's jack them up and put them on a truck and take them over here. So several of them got pulled over here, and then uh, four of them, was two of them here, and then, uh, and then two more here. So on, um, sorry, this is getting a little wiggly for you now. Uh, so on Williams and on Charlesfield Street, you'll see uh, some of the old houses were uh, rescued and pulled over there. Here, where it says intramural field, we're back to looking at the uh, insurance plat map here. Um, uh, you can see that the intramural field is wide open and will uh, become uh, house lots for four buildings. So the uh, building... The second one um, in from the right uh, with the three dormer windows uh, sticking out of the roof um, get moved over here to William Street. It's right around the corner from where we are now. And if you look at the sign, it'll say moved from uh, 41 Charlesfield Street in 1949. And then the one above that with the gable end facing out to the, um, uh, to the street and the doorway on the right um, is now here on Charles Field. So uh, of those 50 houses that were going to be removed, uh, we managed to save four there. And then we looked and there was three vacant lots down on the right. Do you see where it says Mary C. Wheeler School? The Wheeler School owned three house lots down here between Hope Street and uh, Brook Street on uh, Power. And so an, we were able to save another three houses. So um, uh, Lawrence Roth, the longtime librarian of the John Carter Brown Library, lived in this house that has the uh, pediment sticking out in the front, the white painted house, the Greek Revival house here. And uh, Brown owned all these houses. I mean, they weren't knocking down houses they didn't own. And so he said, could I have this house? And they said, sure, take it with you down the street. Down you go. So it is here, now on Williams, uh, on Power. And another professor in the English department, um, uh, Professor Kenny, uh, lived in this house with that wonderful doorway. And the same deal, they gave him a house in, for the price of having it uh, trucked down the hill. He was able to put it back up on Power Street on the second of those lots. And so too was a house here. Um, up on the top of the hill, uh, you can barely see it peeking out behind the trees. That was the third house that went down to Power Street. So there was some success in saving the old houses. But um, the uh, understanding was that this was good for the neighbors. It was good for Brown. It was uh, a community benefit. Um, for the first time, these fraternity houses, who were, uh, which were in... Um, uh, as I say, nobody was uh, thinking about long-range maintenance. If you were 19 years old, you weren't paying ahead for the next uh, 20 years to put a roof on the house. Um, they were in, uh, some of them were pretty tough shape, and so they were now students who lived in safe, clean, modern housing um, under the control of Brown University, and that means Henry Riston. 
The one uh, great house here was owned by a cousin of the Brown family. Uh, we're here on George Street. Here's the um, John Carter Brown Library, and here's the uh, Brown family house. And uh, the architects for the new quad worked forever to try to put it back together, try to tie it into the quad in some way. And in the end, they just gave up. It didn't work. So this is the site of that great big brick house now at the outside of, uh, of Riston Quad. So there it ends up with a new quadrangle with a refectory and um, modern housing and a, a program of uh, moral enrichment for the lads who were in the fraternities. And um, it was 1950 and everybody thought it was a great idea. And that's very different now because we don't just go in there and demolish a neighborhood like this. But um, this, is how, uh, this is how that neighborhood of houses and gas stations and, and luncheonettes uh, became a, a, uh, an amenity at Brown uh, that um, propelled it into a new way of thinking about itself and, and a new way of um, uh, competing and, and pulling itself up by its bootstraps into a world-class university. Well, enter Ruth Simmons, who posed for us just outside here in the hallway. Here she is um, standing in front of the scenic wallpaper. Pref uh, President Simmons came to uh, Brown in the uh, yeah, maybe 2000 and about one. one. Thank you. 2001 is what I'm trying to say. And one of the first questions was in her tenure, um, how do we grow? Because we need to grow. You can't just stay, uh, you can't be a great university for the 1950s forever and ever. You need to, um, uh, need to expand, need to involve. And so how do you do that? And so uh, she uh, commissioned the study of all the buildings on campus, 242 buildings. Which do we want? Which are the good ones which were in the way? Uh, which can we move? Um, which can we spare? Which can we give away? Which can we demolish? Which are treasures? This house, going nowhere. So, um, so when it comes time to build uh, the uh, Watson Institute, uh, do we care enough about this apartment block on the corner of um, maybe benevolent and uh, fair? The Watson, the Gregorian Quad is here, and are we, as we're going to put the, the um, uh, we're going to put the uh, Watson Institute there. Can, do we want to incorporate that building? Can we spare that building? The answer is no. It didn't make the cut. Um, how about a dear little carriage house in the alley uh, behind the English department? Here we are looking down toward the mail room, at the English and the English department's on our left and, and on the right. And so how about that sweet little carriage house? Uh, is it worth trying to keep that? Uh, one of the buildings that has come to surround the campus, but is until recently not a brown building. And the answer is no, didn't make the cut. So that goes. But just to finish up, to say that um, there are small buildings in the neighborhood that are worth saving. Um, this one is on Benevolent Street, a little farther down. It has a historical uh, uh, resonance to it. It was um, the home of Christiana Bannister and her husband, the uh, famed painter Edward Bannister, in the 1880s and early 90s. And so Brown um, acquires it just because it does acquire uh, properties around um, when, it, uh, when they uh, come on the market, uh, tangential properties, and so it acquired this and it fixed it up. So here's the last slide. It just shows that Brown um, does have some sense of the uh, importance of the community and does make a, an effort now and again to, um, uh, to do it right um, out in the neighborhood. Uh, while it's trying to compete or, try, or trying to um, balance uh, its um, 
uh, its responsibility to grow as an institution and maintain its institutional needs with the needs of the community that makes it so great. Uh, not the community making great, but the, the, the community that makes Brown so great. Because as I said at the opening here, um, it's being able to walk out of uh, the main campus and in no time at all walk across the street and see a house like this that makes Brown such a great place. So that's the story of uh, creating that uh, the Riston Quad. Oh, they named it for President Riston after he retired. And that's the story of Wrist and Quad. So thanks for coming. That was terrific. I, uh, you know, I'm sure there are questions. Uh, I imagine Vinny <laughs> has <laughs> some remarks. I just want to point Vincent out. Is that Vincent Banana? Like me, yes. Hello, Hello Vin. We're all wearing masks, and I was ignoring you for this whole time. Hi. Good to see you. I wouldn't miss this. I mean, to be able to draw anyone out on a night like this. That's an accomplishment. Well, I'm glad we didn't schedule it for Friday night. No, that's true. That's true. That's a good one. Yeah. It was an excellent thing. Obviously, you did the whole thing uh, a cappella without a note and showing how deeply you know this campus and how, you're, uh, how you were steeped in it all those years. And that's not counting all the, all the uh, art and carpets and furniture and artworks and everything else that you were steward of. And, uh, supervisor of this incredible restoration of this great, great house. So, uh, you're you're the you. right guy for this lecture. Well, thanks. Great. Good and we so enjoyed your article, uh, your, your essay in the Globe oh, yeah. about, uh, about Brown just losing his way here yeah. and demolishing right. the- Right. No, I'm there. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not invited to too many cocktail parties here. <laughs> but, uh, I think I angered them, but anyway, we have to say the truth, right? Well, we think of it as the goose that laid the golden egg. It's, yeah. it's the neighborhood that makes Brown so great. No, it really is. And so it's our responsibility not to go out and destroy the neighborhood. Uh, I was standing at, uh, I don't need to dominate questions that other people want to ask. I was standing at the corner of Brown and, and the gate there, right onto the wrist, right onto the main quad, right at the John Carter Brown Library. It steps down from John Carter, and you're right out on George Street. And a car came by and stopped. Uh, and paid, I thought, one of the great compliments to Brown. The lady with a non-Rhode Island license plate, of course, said, can you tell me where the actual campus is? <laughs> and, and the, which, and which I said, this is the most eloquent statement of what, what this is all about here, that, that we're not some fenced off place where you can tell that you're now there, and all the signs and posts, as you said, fences and gates. Uh, we have gates, but they're purely decorative. You can penetrate it pretty much anywhere. So I thought that was a great comment on how they didn't get that we were at a time when the style was for campuses like Dartmouth and Princeton. And uh, of course, Columbia couldn't be that way because it was in the city. It was to be in a reserved, sylvan place where you could be removed from the world. And to, to create a campus so much in the middle of the city and so much uh, with, with such an urban character to it, I still think is one of the things that, you know, brown planners don't get about this is that this is really to be preserved. And this story of moving these houses is great. I didn't quite know all these moves that were made uh, when risk. I knew it was cleared, and I knew mostly it was demolished, but a lot of really good ones got moved. Yeah. They, they could find room for seven of them. Seven. And there was another campaign a few years later to create a dorm for, or a quadrangle, for the people who were not in fraternities. Uh -huh. and, uh, yeah. and they named that Keeney Quad. We can see it right out these windows. Yeah. And um, the, we had used up every spare building lot. So some mighty fine buildings got demolished because they were not able to move a single one uh, for the next, next campaign. What would have happened now? Wouldn't it, I, yeah, yeah. With too many, I would have been a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> one, might, one might say that uh, looking back at Riston, I think, compared to some of the buildings we did later and we're about to do yeah. right now. Yeah. It's actually quite contextual and in scale, yeah. quite fitting to the neighborhood. We no, lost that yeah. ability a little bit. I, I don't want to say too much, but in any case, looking at Riston and some of those good pictures you have of it, uh, those buildings, no modern architect today would be caught dead uh, building those colonial style buildings today and be called themselves an architecture of the first. But actually, from a human scale, they broke down what could have been big phalanxes of modern buildings 
you broke them down into domestic sized buildings that lent themselves to you lived in a house and you knew your house, whether it was a fraternity house or regular dormitory. So they, they broke down the, the quite a large building campus there into more domestic size uh, and, and, and enclosed it so you're inside the arms of the school. A lot of wonderful human things is something that most modernists, not teacher, but other modernists would, would write off as, as just uh, kitsch or, you know, or so pretty good job or some quad, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And it took me a long time to realize, one day it was like, oh my god, I never realized yeah. that I walked home through Riston and suddenly I realized that every doorway is different. Yeah, right. Some have columns, some have pilasters. Yeah, it's like a, you can study architecture right. by just walking through that. Yeah. Uh, Camp's mm -hmm. a little bit like uh, what Jefferson did in, uh, at UVA, where yeah. there's so many different architectural yeah, details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And same happened here, I never noticed it. And then one day I realized it's all different on purpose. Yeah. So it's a good, wonderful. It's a good achievement. Yeah. It's still beautiful. Yes. May I ask one more question? It was just a, a, a small side note, where, but you were, you were mentioning that uh, some buildings. Uh, so so there was, it was about. So my question is about the, the, the Texas you you were talking about. Uh, sorry, could I ask you to just? We won't tell oh. Brown University you've lowered your mask. Okay, okay I'm sorry. Me to hear you. <laughs> yeah. So you have been t telling us something about Texas who who had to be paid for buildings which had an address with a house number. And the, the, it, it seems for me that there was a strategy to give a name to a house. And once there was a name for the house, it was tax-free. So uh, can I, you just give me some, some background? Because no, that's, that's very interesting. I'm sorry. What I meant to be saying was that uh, private houses were taxed, but uh, buildings owned by Brown University were not taxed. And so uh, the president asked fraternities to uh, transfer title to the university. And, there, the, and so then the, after that, the fraternities would no longer be taxed for the real estate. Okay, all right. It, it sounds like I described it in a circuitous way. Yeah, all right, yeah, thank you. I don't even know how it is in Germany, but we, hospitals and uh, universities don't pay taxes here. So whenever a house is transferred into the ownership yeah. of Brown, obviously the city loses income, right? So, it's a big issue, and the man who stood here, Brett Smiley, the other day, running for mayor, he addressed that issue too, and there's, you know, obviously a constant causation between the city and, yeah. and that's great. Uh, if you're all, if there are no further questions, I would love to thank our speaker, Rob Emlin, yeah. once again for a great. wonderfully delivered lecture and ending here with our banister. Excellent. Was really you're welcome. My pleasure. And I'd like to invite you all. Yeah. But Oh, look at this. This is, I mean, about Ken, Kenny Quad. Yeah. But there's Henry Riston. Yeah. And if you look at the um, yeah. exhaust, that bulldozer is running. Yeah. And he just is about to put it in gear and go knock down really? some more buildings. Exactly. Oh, that's fantastic. Wow. You see the two guys on the far left with those big hats? Those are the corporation Bob members. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, isn't that great? <laughs> what, what a collection you have. I thought you just had postcards, but you've got a lot. This is the university archives. Ah, and I bless see. their hearts for you yeah. know, photographing the buildings they were going to knock yeah, down. that's Thanks for coming.